Welcome to Trends with Benefits, a podcast by Van Eck with a forward-looking perspective. We explore new ways of thinking about the markets, investing, work, and life. Here's your host, Ed Lopez. Welcome to another episode of Trends with Benefits. I am Ed Lopez, and my honored guest today is Howard Lindzen. Howard, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Howard, you're a notable investor and entrepreneur founder and general partner of uh, Social Leverage. And you've been involved with a, a number of companies. I wonder if you could kind of talk through some of your roster of, of companies that you've been through. I would note like things like Stock Twits or, or Robin Hood and Rally Road. It, yeah. they, they all tend to be kind of tech oriented, right? Yeah. Software oriented. I am. Uh, so when you're a Jewish kid in Toronto in the, in the 70s, you got to be, you had three choices, lawyer, doctor, accountant, and uh the only thing I knew was that I was never going to be one of those three. So I fled to Arizona State, which was kind of like Harvard of the West. Stayed in the U.S. 2005, 2006 comes along and I'm kind of late in my life in my 40s. And, and you know, it was a trader, loved the markets. It just became possible, I thought, to to build everything once YouTube came out and, and Twitter and, and Facebook and this whole progression of new media. And I started a company called Wall Strip, which is probably my claim to fame, which was just CNBC on YouTube. You know, the whole vision was, I'm going to, I hate CNBC, so I'm going to do CNBC on YouTube. And right place, right time, CBS, eight months into starting the company, acquired us. And all of a sudden, I was like Clarence Beaks of uh, media. You know, CBS was paying me. I went from like uh, no experience in media to having a job at CBS and having my company bought by CBS. And I think that in itself this kind of Larry David stumble upon uh, fame or, you know, if I could do it, anybody could do it. So, you know, since that time, I've just gone deeper and deeper into financial services, financial tech, uh, software, media. So, you know, I started Stock Twits, which was Twitter for finance or Twitter for stocks. You know, that's still around today. It's probably the largest social network growing really fast. And, uh, you know, I'm not operating anymore and, and started social leverage to invest in the rest of what I thought, you know, my, all the things I wanted to see, you know, I'll start, you know, putting the vibe out there and seeing if we can find people to build them. And, uh, you know, so Robin Hood, eToro, obviously stock twits, Rally Road, uh, Koi Fin. So I continue to just scratch that itch around what are the products that I would use and then my kids would use. Uh, if they wanted to trade. So really around this do-it-yourself investor with this, you know, unique take, like I'm just, if, if I would use it, I think a lot of other people would use it. Like, I don't think I can spot billion dollar ideas, but in a world where, um, you know, the world has shrunk and it was global until very recently and, and software kind of built network effects, uh, I felt like um, anything could happen. So as long as we controlled, uh, the valuations early and, and the cap table and, and really were smart with the founders around building these things. We didn't have to build billion dollar companies. So that's kind of where we are today. How many different companies are, is uh, social leverage involved with at this point? Today, I think today active we're over 80. So it's, we're, we're investing out of our third fund. I was investing a lot with the money I made up from wall strip in 2007, 2008, with my own money. And, and social leverage started in 2013. The first fund was six million. Uh, the second fund was 2015, which was 21 million. And then uh, the third fund uh, we closed in 2018, which is about 45 million. I have two partners, a very lean operation, no staff. Um, and we just brought on a fourth partner as we think through fund four in LA. So we really think New York, LA, uh, the Southwest. I'm San Diego, Phoenix. My partner Gary is in. Uh, Del Mar and he goes up to San Francisco. He handles that. He lived there for a while. And Tom is in Phoenix. He runs day to day. And then we brought on a fourth partner, Ross Hoffman, who was at Twitter for seven years and YouTube before that to help our companies. And he's in LA. I think the next move, you know, we're very close with the Van Eck people, but the next move would be uh, feet on the ground in New York. But, you know, COVID hit and we decided to do LA first. Uh, in New York, I think it'll take a few years for everything to kind of play out and get, you know, get the streets busy again, hopefully a vaccine or just good policy and uh, cooler heads prevail and we, and we beat the virus. But New York, I think it's probably the center point for we need to see New York healthy, like 
for me to feel really confident, I need to see all my friends in New York running around the streets and going to restaurants, you know, just for the good of the world. Like New York needs to have that pulse. What do you think COVID has done for your portfolio of companies, either good or bad, or uh, for even future investments? Has it accelerated certain trends that you've been watching? So it's really the key question, right? Like what happened? Like the fir- first month was a daze, right? Because we're just a little bit lucky. Uh, you know, you need to, you know, you work hard, you spin a thousand plates, uh, someone told me, and if you work hard, you're going to get lucky once in a while. I think I got lucky, you know, uh, you know, I wouldn't have predicted any of this other than I thought the trend. So it accelerated this trend of onboarding people. You know, you have Robin Hood, eToro, crypto exchanges. It was all there. And this two to three month lights out period onboarded all these people that had needed to look at the markets. And it was one of these strange periods where as much as I love the markets, I'm too busy to watch them. But with products like Koifin and Robinhood and StockTwits, it was like having a ground, you know, Bloomberg, you know, had that world. And, and But this now opened up this whole intensity of staring at the markets and talking to your friends on all the social networks and trying to pick new winners like Peloton or Beyond Meat or gold or crypto. I mean, the conversations have expanded a hundredfold in an era where there's no other choice. What are you going to talk about? Yeah. And so, 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 so my portfolio luckily has exploded, you know, for, you know, companies have doubled and tripled in data. The other big ones are work from home. Obviously education is going to evolve. So for those venture capitalists that have exposure to those in healthcare, telemedicine, they're experienced the same thing. Where we're seeing trouble, and I think this was, the signals was there with the sloppiness of SoftBank and all this late stage venture capital and let's never go public and yada, yada, yada. Well, we see the flaws in that. Airbnb, which seemed invincible, right? Never needed to go public. All of a sudden had to take debt money a month ago at like great terms to the debt people, right? Like no one would have predicted that. So I think we've seen large anything exposed to GDP, even large venture capitalists have been hammered. Travel, entertainment, not so much into travel, uh, um, hospitality, um, events. Kind of those analog Uh, businesses. (laughs) seems like everything has gone online. Plus even digital, like whether you're booking.com or whether you're Airbnb or Uber, right? Like Uber's now had to finally commit to being a Uber a food delivery company. There is so much turmoil, and through this is going to be the bigger going to get bigger with Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google. The government can't stop them right now. They're busy fighting a virus. If we could even call them fighting a virus, but like you think you think they're going to be able to stop these companies in a virus? No way. So you're going to see the big get bigger. And you're going to see certain sectors, like I said, healthcare, fintech, gaming, uh, education, really explode. So if you were lucky enough to be in those spaces, you know, some people will brag and say they're smart. I mean, it was really just a digital economy has exploded. Right. I mean, well, at some point, will all companies become tech companies to, to some extent? They, they're going to have to have a digital game, right? I think we, I think we're seeing it, right? We're just, I, we're talking about it recently with the banks, right? They continue to go down. Wells Fargo, Citibank. Goldman, JP Morgan are not participating in this rally. And you see PayPal, Square, Crypto, uh, Jihad to the upside, right? Like gold's up. People, the gold bugs are happy it's up. But like for the volatility, cryptos, Bitcoin's up more than gold this year. So we could joke that, you know, what, you know, Bitcoin was not really tracking, uh, was not really a hedge. But I never considered it a hedge. It's just a piece of software that's going to be volatile because it doesn't have a business plan or a business model, but it's the perfect proxy for a decentralized piece of software. Um, you just The only thing you can do is pass it around. I think the financial world is really changing and COVID accelerated that as well. This is not a good time to be a bank. If I'm, if I'm, uh, a bi- if I'm Airbnb or, or Uber, th- if Uber hadn't done their late IPO now, you could do a direct listing uh, at the end of this year or next year, you know, hire a few good lawyers from the SEC and do your own direct listing if you're a consumer brand. So it's going to get worse for the Goldman's. All those businesses they used to make money from are going away. You know, and that's the kind of stuff we're not sure about. Will those changes bring down the whole market? Uh, will commercial real estate bring down tech stocks? Like how connected really are they? And we're starting to see that, right? In the last week, commercial real estate stocks are getting hammered, not because of the first bout of COVID, but because Twitter and Microsoft said, maybe you never need to come back to work. I mean, those are those are real statements from huge companies 
uh, that affect New York and, and San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, totally. Let's talk a little bit about how you guys identify or how you identify different companies that you've invested in in the past. Are you working off a, a personal theme of things that you would like to see and change and therefore go out and find entrepreneurs doing that? Do companies come to you to try to get some uh, seed investment? How, how has it worked in the past? There's no one way. I think, you know, as, as social leverage, our brand, just like Van Eck, you, you have great, you, sometimes you have a great product or you get lucky, you find a great founder like, like I have in the past. I think the easiest, they talk about a couple things, right? Uh, Taleb talks about skin in the game. Um, VCs talk about both sides of the table. You know, I've been an entrepreneur, therefore I know what it's like to be an entrepreneur. You know, those are two famous things that, you know, people fall back on. But, you know, there's levels of that. There's levels of skin in the game and there's levels of both sides of the table. Really, were you an entrepreneur? Really, do you, do you really understand what it's like uh, to go through, you know, the valley of death where your, your numbers aren't moving? Uh, and so I think our business... I really have been on both sides of the table. So are my partners, Gary, uh, one of my partners, last company was acquired by Salesforce where he worked at for four years. So he's more focused on enterprise and there's kind of an enterprise mafia over the years out of Salesforce um, that um, I'll give you an example. One, 1% 1 of sales, if you start an enterprise company and you just attack Salesforce for just trying to get 1% of their business, that's a unicorn potential, right? You know, so, you know, it's over a hundred billion dollar company that, uh, you know, a lot of people complain about. So there's just this endless opportunity. I think you have to have been, domain experience really matters. So when I started as a trader, I hated Wall Street Journal. I couldn't afford Bloomberg. Uh, it didn't, have, you know, Yahoo, fun. I didn't have the tools. So I said, you know, I was always on the lookout for things as someone who couldn't afford all the best tools. You know, how do I make it easier? How do I build an edge as a hedge fund? And finally, I gave up. And in 2005, I was like, well, Vanguard, like, what, what am I doing without all the best tools and Vanguard and competing against Vanguard? So I threw up my hands and I said, I got to find a new career. I think people have to be really honest with themselves and figure out what their edge is. For me, it was like I had this view of the world. Uh, technology was making it easier. And it was just an abundance of, of things combining to make me leave my job as a hedge fund manager and close my fund and and start investing in startups then i started because of wall strip i had all this domain experience and people were sending me deals and you know of course i made a lot of mistakes and then through those mistakes of investing in the wrong people or like drifting away from my knowledge base you get a lot of zeros and you realize hey what am i good at where should i spend my time so for me it's like by writing and being an expert and just projecting myself as someone who's, you know, uh, wants to improve do-it-yourself individual investing. It's a combination of everything, attending events, which will be harder now, writing every day, doing my podcast, talking to founders and making sure that if you're a financial services, just like doing your podcast, if you're a financial services uh, founder, you should be calling social leverage. So it's part like I got to make sure that our brand is out there by doing this type of stuff and, and have and clear thinking that people who are starting the next E-Trade call me. And then partly is I also then am looking for the next E-Trades and putting the vibe out there, calling lawyers, make, speaking with Yon and Van Eck, speaking with all the leaders in financial services uh, to find out what they're seeing. Because it, I'm not going to get every deal, but it really is embarrassing if I miss the next Robin Hood. Like that's the pressure of my job is like, it's, there's only a few great ones. And if you're going to be an expert in a, if you're going to project yourself to be a leader in a category, you got to make sure you see those things. If you were advising uh, an investor in investing in a venture cap deal or perhaps in a social leverage uh, fund, how do you talk about it? Like how, how much should somebody allocate in their portfolio to uh, venture investing? Great question. I believe that if people are going to invest in the stock market, uh, the average person that wants to try, they should do individual stocks and they should develop a system and find mentors and take risk and try and trounce the markets. It seems like you've only needed the top five stocks at the S&P 500 to do well over the last couple of years. Basically, <laughs> Fang, you could go Fang, you could close an index now by buying Fang and like yeah. pick two where you really feel you're an expert, find two companies that you love with and go with those two. And you're basically cloning the S&P with a little extra risk but it's a flavor that you can do instead of owning 500 companies. But that's just a personal, and I think we're going to get this turn where like, 
you never can predict when the trend of everybody owning the same stocks is, which has been, you know, a dollar cost average into the S&P, which I don't think is a bad strategy, it's just not for me. So the only thing that I would say different than when I started was don't, if it's not your full-time job, do not try and pick companies yourself, startup companies yourself. I got feel a little bit lucky. I entered do it yourself uh, uh, angel investing in 2006, 2007. I'd sold my company Wall Strip. I was flush. New York was just starting to boom. You know, you had the financial crash, but you had all these startups in software and Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. And so it was very easy to acquire customers because back in 2006, 2007, 2008, those companies didn't know how to charge for, you know, using them. So all like we could buy users on Facebook for a penny, right? So we were, we were, we were on their backs growing, uh, you know, for pennies on the dollar. Today, if you go to Facebook to try and buy a customer, they know how to price that. So, you know, it's a much different world in growing your business in 2020 versus 2007, 2008. So my first experience of angel investing, I thought I was a genius. Everything I invested in was working. Um, but if you look at it today, it's going to be much harder because those companies have figured a way to arbitrage, to know the arbitrage. Find some fund managers who really love doing what they're doing. You're going to pay a little more in fees. You're not going to have the same type of upside returns, but you're going to get way more uh, access to early stage investing by investing in funds like social leverage. And there's hundreds of people, thousands of people like me that are doing this. And um, I think that's the future. I think, I think this next generation of young people wants to invest. They're going to be an investing class. We're printing money and throwing it out of airplanes to people anyways. We're sending people $1,200 a month, right? So but people are going to want to learn how to invest. And so I think we're going to have this humongous investing class. And um, I think the alpha is going to continue to be in the eyes and the ears and your feet and your network. And so the best way to speed that all up is to back funds at uh, early. I think we're at the beginning phases. Yeah, the funds that you guys launch, are they uh, funds that invest in, uh, how many different companies per fund? Good question. So we, we're a little more, you know, tried everything. And our first fund was 33 companies and I hated it. I hated the fact that it just couldn't, it was just too many companies, right? They call it spray and pray in our industry, whatever, because unlike, investing in the S&P 500 or an index fund, when you invest in stocks, you're trying to create a diversified portfolio. In, in, in angel investing, it's all about power law. You're trying to find one company that just explodes, right? You're paying me to find Robinhood because the odds of you know, failure are very high, just like a corner store. I mean, you can improve the odds with software and a big global market and all this network effects. But in the end, it's still hard to build a big company. So in, in venture investing and in angel investing, it's more about power law. You know, Robin, one Robinhood pays for 100 failures. Whereas, you know, in the st I try and do the same thing in the stock market myself. This is why I like to pick individual stocks versus the index. But in, in, it's much more applicable to venture investing. So we're now like 20 companies per fund. Uh, we're taking bigger pieces, board seats. We're much more involved uh, uh, at the early, early stage where we can help this embryonic company get to 10 or 20 employees before we bring on the next stage of, of investors. So our bet is when you work with social leverage, our founders know that if they deliver on product and hard work and knowledge and, and uh, commitment and um, goodwill and do their job, if they partner with social leverage, they're going to get their next round of capital. Um, we can't predict the very end game, but our job at social leverage is to make sure if you do your job, social leverage does its job and you're going to have great financial partners for the next three, four years, still got to have still got to have a lot of luck, still have the market still has to develop. You still have to hire well, you still have to find product market fit, you know, yada, yada, yada. But um, that's our job. What are some resources for people looking to do venture investing or angel investing? Are there are there services uh, like AngelList or something like that as well, right? That they could go to. Do you have any other ideas of how people can get up to speed? Great question. AngelList is a great resource. Full disclosure, I'm a, an investor in AngelList from way back in 2010. I think I think the thing is to 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 network with venture capitalists. A16Z is like is like kind of the Wall Street Journal of venture investing. That's Mark Andreessen's firm. If you go to their firm's website, it's really just a content site. 
So really venture capitalists, if you search venture capitalists in Google and just start doing research and go to their blogs, you're going to start reading and everybody's pimping their own books and talking their own books. But guess what? There's not liquidity to those things. So they have real egg on their face when they're wrong, right? It's not like they can pimp a stock and it goes up the next day and they're a genius, right? They're putting their real, they're digging in and putting real thoughts into their, into their writing and their thesis because they're going to be wrong for five years if they're wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think if you start at the top and go to like Mark and Dreesen site at A16Z, um, and go from there. And then on Twitter, there's so many venture capitalists. If you follow me, you're going to end up meeting a hundred venture capitalists. People have to find out what they love. Is it food? Is it fintech? Is it healthcare? Is, is it drones? Is it, there's so many different, is it robots? Is it AI? Is it uh, agriculture? I mean, there's something for everybody right now in venture capital and you just have to find the right people. You really do have to find the right people. And then you have to, you know, commit. You were asking, how much do I commit to this? If it's five to 20%, the most important thing is not to put it all in at once. So, so venture investing is a lot like wine or food. Like things can go wrong, right? The smartest person in the world, Mark Andreessen at, at this, if you had invested in their Google Glass fund that was inspired by, oh, Google Glass is going to be the next great thing, you know, the glasses, you got a lot of zeros. So even though you bet with the smartest people, they picked you know, if the platform doesn't evolve, you're going to have a lot of zeros. So I think when you're doing venture investing, you have to commit to like 10 years or 15 years. You got to say, if I have a million dollars that I want to put in venture capital, I'm going to not, I'm going to be very disciplined. I'm going to put 250 grand into four funds over the next 10 years and not try and cherry pick the timing of this one manager. Because even the best managers can have a bad crop, right? The weather, the platform, you know, so, so I think you have to, be, with technology, you have to be really, you can't predict which one's going to be the great batch. And I think that's like vineyards and wine are the same thing. You know, things can go wrong. And so you have to try and not time the market. And so, so it's just, a lot of that is like the same thing. You got to be in the stock market. You have to be consistent and you have to find good people and then you can't panic. You have to just have a plan. So you'd say maybe find a good theme and then take some time buying different companies within that theme or that trend. That theme or find some managers that you like and don't try and put it all in on one, their first fund. Like commit, if you find people that you like, say, listen, I'm going to be with you for 10 years. I'm going to do it over three funds and I have a million dollars to invest. So I'll do 333,000 per fund, you know, and then try and stick with the plan. It's very hard to do because first fund you invest in the first fund. And then three years later, they hit you up for the next fund and you go, well, you haven't returned any money. So I'm going to wait. Well, that's just not how it works. So it's, it's just not the same as stock investing. The liquidity is different. And so you have to find people who are really have domain experience and really commit to trying to, understand the people that you're working with because it's not a, a very simple business. Let's talk about your podcast, Panic with Friends. What's uh, what's yeah. the story behind the name and when did you start the podcast? I think around the same time. Really, I'm doing it for me and to think about the future. You ask about future spotting. The only way to future spot is to talk to really smart people who are living in the future, right? Like, uh, the best the best VC benchmark is like not about predicting the future. They they say it's about being really good at what's happening right now. And so I'm trying to be really good at what's happening right now. And the only way to, to be good at that is to use all the tools that exist right now and talk to really smart people right now and kind of develop these theses and build your network. So this idea of panic with friends is the VIX hit 30 uh, in March. You could just see. The world was coming unglued in March. You know, you just, the markets were starting to really drip down and crash in the beginning of March. And all my friends, as usual, VIX crosses 30, you know, start calling me for free advice. My free advice is as good as anybody's free advice, which is don't follow my free advice. Uh, you know, you didn't call me when you put yourself in the trade. Why are you calling me now? <laughs> so, uh, so to, so to kind of like short, that whole thing, I just said, listen, I'll do a show every day with the smartest people I know called Panic with Friends. And we'll just, you know, we'll do 10 shows and we'll talk about panic. And, um, you know, get the smart Jim O'Shaughnessy and Fred Wilson and all these people that I have friends with to say, come on and let's talk about panic and, you know, what it's like to go through panics. This panic is different than the last panic, but like, what is it like? And it just was, people loved it. And, you know, and now I'm 80 episodes in and, you know, I never foresaw doing 80 episodes because 
not because I didn't think the pandemic would last. It's just like, it's a lot of work, as you know, uh, you're doing it. And, but it's also been completely fulfilling and people really appreciate it. So every day I've had two or three guests that talk about panic and talk about the future and talk about, you know, so I've had some great guests from like, food VCs to just tr tr true VCs to traders. And we just talk about the crash and what previous crashes they've ridden through and what's their worst trade. And how, you know, how did it feel to be panicked in 01 or 97 or 98? Um, and so I think younger kids on stock twits and my following on Twitter really appreciate hearing veterans say they don't know what the fuck's going on either. And I don't think people hear that enough. They hear like they turn on the TV and it's like all this confidence, like, you know, it's like, this is what the market's going to do tomorrow. I don't think people know that. And I'm trying to take a step back to talk to people that say they don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but odds are these are the things that are happening. So let's talk about that a little bit. Thinking longer term, coming out of this, what's one long-term trend you see playing out over the next year or several years? For me, it's like, again, it's just, I, I can only know what I know, right? I can't project how you're going to do your life or how other people are. I, I have to assume New York's going to come back or else we have real trouble. We need a New York. We need an LA. I don't know if we need a San Francisco, to be honest. Like I, I'm not a San Francisco fan and I just thought so many things were wrong with it. It's a beautiful city, whatever. We need a New York. Okay. The question is how many more Buffaloes, like if you think of the steel analogy, when Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, those became Detroit, like ghost towns, we're going to have more ghost towns. Okay, and that's scary from COVID. And we're going to have green zones and red zones, potentially the way this country is fighting, you know, of like safe. Like, so it's hard to predict where, where that part goes out. So anything that's heavily GDP reliant and travel reliant and hospitality reliant, I'm not bearish. I'm like, dude, I'm just not interested. I really have to keep a, a clear head. So it has to be fully digital for me to even get interested anymore, right? Um, you just can't be a land-based business for me and you can't be reliant on travel so you have to find businesses that can do their sales from you know without face to face at least for the next year or two so i'm super bullish on on things that that's that that build that process or that benefit from that process and that's you know investing because we can do that from anywhere that's tools to help us invest and and then for companies starting right now more software to help them do all their jobs right and in the public markets at zoom and slack and you know uh, google and amazon with e-commerce so e-commerce is another thing i'm very bullish on right one thing that i got wrong that may come back is the pop-up stores i felt like you know, it was one thing to start out online, but then I thought a lot of companies, and it was starting to happen where they'd open a store in Soho or they'd open a store in, you know, somewhere in New York or London to bring their offline brand, to bring their online brand offline. So we we're seeing, seeing a lot of that where you started out online and then you would see a store pop up in Soho, whether it was for a shoe company or even Rally Road, right? And that is a big change. Like if, if, if stores aren't gonna open and we're not gonna get street traffic back for two years, you know, we're seeing this shift back to 100% e-commerce, right? Shopify, Amazon, Facebook, and that's not good. So, you know, that could be a trend that may change. Um, and that's why I want to see New York back strong. But um, for me, it's it's more of the same. It's like software that helps companies do billing, uh, run more efficiently to products that help you and me and everybody that's listening to this trade and invest and communicate from wherever they are, their basement, their penthouse, their uh, the airplane, wherever they happen to be, pulling, shrinking that world. And then the other thing is deglobalization, right? Like things are going to get made local. You know, 3D printing is more important than it ever was, right? Should, you know, someone, a, a company called InCountry, one of the founders that we backed, he's saying, what did it really make sense that all the washing machines and, and fridges came from one place in China? Like, does that really make sense? To, you know, to save a hundred bucks, maybe I should buy my fridge from a local guy and just puts his name on the fridge, knowing that he can 3D print the part and I'm going to get great service from, and I'll pay a little more for my fridge or my television or, or whatever. So I think we're going to see a lot of this deglobalization and that's really bad again for GDP and the economy for a long time, because we're just so used to having all this stuff flowing. Do you think that potentially leads to inflation, bringing things back locally? We're going to have massive inflation, but also we're going to have massive deflation and things. So I try not to get caught up in the weeds of what is inflation and deflation. I think the price of milk stays the same. 
uh, or maybe even drops, but the price of a Van Gogh or the price of a collector car or something in pop culture could go through the roof. A, a price of Zoom, you know, is, is, even though Zoom's a great company, how do you, like, just, there's so few stocks to choose from that everybody owns the same stocks and this driving up the prices. So I think you're going to have massive inflation in assets that are scarce and necessary or pop culture or weird uh, or limited, but you're going to have massive deflation in, like, you know, certain things. And so I try not to think about it overall other than just trying to stick to what I know. All right, let's do our trend or fad segments, kind of our speed round. I'm going to mention a few different concepts and you can tell me whether you think it's a trend or fad. Feel free to riff on it if you'd like or, or not. Plant-based meat, trend or fad? I think it's combination. It's a trend in that it's a big country and there's a lot of people that uh, are going to get sold plant-based meat. I just, but I also think it's a fad in the sense that we can do way better. And this is just the beginning of like a huge trend towards healthy living. Yeah. So uh, a little bit of both. How about the return of short golf courses, trend or fad? I love the idea. I think we're starting to see some of the biggest clubs in Phoenix, uh, the fanciest clubs do these eight, 18 hole part three courses, you know, and I think I'd l- I love golf. I think golf is going to benefit, but I hate 7,200 yard courses and five hour rounds and everything else. So I think, you know, I think we're, you know, I've been playing a little bit. I never get to play. Like, I love that there's no tr- rakes in the bunker. I love that I'm driving my own cart or walking. Um, I love everything about the rules, the cup, like you don't have to reach into the cup. I love everything about going faster and having more fun and being outside but golf became a sport about technology and like the pros and not about the real people that play the game and just, you know, betting with your friends and a hundred yard hole can be just as hard as a 300 yard hole. You still have to hit a good shot. So I'm bullish on the idea of, of, of faster golf. How about space investing trend or fad? I just think it's dumb. <laughs> There's a million ways for me to die. I don't want to die in space. I have no interest. So I think it's a niche, stupid, egotistical, but very important to some, you know, to the universe to have. And in a recession, it makes no sense to me. Like it's, you know, Virgin Galactic was well-produced back, um, you know, from Branson. But in a world where the 1% have all these advantages living in America, uh, why the hell do they want to go to space? I don't get it. Howard, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate the, the discussion. How can people find you? I mean, you're everywhere, actually. Yeah, the easiest to search my name, Howard Lindzen. I have a blog. I write every day. It's free, you know, into your inbox at 9 a.m. I write about trends in the markets and uh, my prostate, I like to say. I write about men problems, 54-year-old guy problems, uh, manscaping, prostate. And then on, <laughs> on, on, so it's just you search my name and you can find everywhere that I am. Howard, awesome. Thanks again. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, great to talk to you.